these regulations uh, took the time that a drug had to go through the process from lab bench to the market from four to 14 years. I mean, it added a decade onto the development process. And because of that, the costs went up and they went up exponentially and they're still going up exponentially. From Alcapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I've got a great first-time guest coming on. I'm actually kind of surprised I haven't had her on yet. We've been doing this show since 2011. Uh, I've seen her name all over the place, and I just never, we've never really connected. She wasn't fully aware of our show or anything, so uh, some sort of uh, glitch in the matrix there because she's very on the same path as uh, what we're on, and uh, she's very well known. She actually ran for president of the Libertarian Party in 2008 in the U.S. She's there in Texas today, and she's written a number of books, including including Healing Our World, the other piece of the puzzle. She's also written a book called Short Answers to the, to the Tough Questions. And she just came out with a book called Death by Regulation, which uh, sounds right up my alley. Uh, as you know, on this show, we talk a lot about health and how the government and you know, all the things involved with government are really destroying uh, a lot of people's health on purpose, in my opinion. We'll get into that with Mary Ruart. It's her first time coming on Anarchats. Real pleasure to have you on, Mary. Uh, first question I have to ask you, though, is how did you become a volunteerist? Ah. <laughs> Well, I started out with Ayn Rand in college, and I think from there it was pretty easy after being introduced to the non-aggression principle to see that government as a monopoly on force would always violate that principle. So that's pretty much how, how I became a voluntarist. That's great. And so you went from Ayn Rand, which actually is one of the top, uh, I've asked this question of about 500 people so far. That's about how many guests we've had on our show. Uh, definitely Ayn Rand's up there. Uh, Ron Paul's definitely up there. And then there's a number of others, Murray Rothbard, and a whole other swath of uh, answers to the question. But Ayn Rand's definitely up there. But uh, was there something that led you after reading Ayn Rand towards more understanding libertarianism? Well, yes. I mean, after, after my college years, I began, after a few other years, <laughs> I began working in Kalamazoo, Michigan for the Upjohn Company. And there was an advertisement in the paper for the Libertarian Party. And I knew about the party because it had advertised in Reason Magazine. I had sent in my name and everything. I never heard anything. But as soon as I saw that there was going to be a meeting, I came in. And what we used for our educational purposes were the uh, records by Nathaniel Brandon and the what is I think ended up being a 36 uh, pamphlet series by the um, International Society for Individual Liberty, which um, which I currently chair as Liberty International because our acronym was ISIL and we kept getting hacked. Uh, our website was taken down three times, so we figured we'd better change our name. And those those little pamphlets were written by volunteerists, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think that it, it became pretty obvious to me that the solutions were all in that realm and not, not with government, even a limited government. That's great. And it uh, goes to show for people out there, as I've said in the past, you know, just get out there and, and tell people about uh, libertarianism because that's how it gets to people. So Ayn Rand uh, wrote uh, a number of fiction books and that really got a, a lot of people to start thinking about these things. And then, as Mary said, she just ran into some pamphlets or some advertisements from people like uh, Reason Magazine and libertarian uh, things like that. And that's how she found out about it. So we now have the Internet so we can get this information out there a lot more. So every single person who does their part in whether, whatever form it might be, it could be music, could be writing books, could be uh, just doing something, just getting the, the word out there. Because really what the case is, the reason, I, I, in my opinion, there isn't more libertarians is because most people don't even know there is libertarianism. They're, they've been really brainwashed into believing, well, there's this uh, government and there's this democracy, which wasn't even part of the U.S. when it started. And now you have two people you have to choose from every four years who will rule you. And, and people aren't aware there's another choice. So uh, Mary's story really goes to show just, you know, getting information out there 
can really start to wake people up. And I know, Mary, you've woke a lot of people up with a lot of your stuff that you do, especially your books. Um, I don't know where you want to get started with the books, but the reason I actually um, uh, decided that I found out about you and wanted to have you on is I saw a great quote from you about anarchy. I think uh, past Anarchast guest Joby Weeks posted on Facebook and it was something about how beautiful anarchy was and things like that. And I was like, okay, this person understands anarchism because a lot of people uh, still think that anarchism means violence and chaos and all kinds of stuff. And, and really, uh, it's the exact opposite of that, which shouldn't come as a sur surprise to many people that most of what you hear from the media and the government is the exact opposite of what it is. And uh, you, you just wrote a recent book, which I think we should get into, which is uh, Death by Regulation. And uh, you may not know, but I also do something called The Dollar Vigilante, where I, it's a nar narco-capitalist financial newsletter where we uh, advise people on what to be investing in and things like that. And a big part of what we talk about is how regulations just destroy everything. There's, there's no instance of regulations helping Helping it, as a whole, uh, you know, all the people, and in fact, it's usually used by the 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 big people, the the, the very rich people, to uh, really monopolize their industry. So, maybe you can just uh, lead off with what the book uh, "Death by Regulation" is all about. Sure. Well, you know, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 19 years, and when I started in the mid 70s, uh, the 1962 regulations that had been passed and been fought over in the courts were really starting to take hold. And they were kind of open-ended, so every year they metastasized. And it got to the point where towards the end of my tenure with the Upjohn Company, I used to joke with the people in my lab that we were so busy meeting the regulations, we had no time to discover new drugs and new cures for disease. And, you know, of course we had to laugh about it, but it wasn't really a laughing matter because these regulations uh, took the time that a drug had to go through the process from lab bench to market from four to 14 years. I mean, it added a decade onto the development process. And because of that, the costs went up, and they went up exponentially, and they're still going up exponentially. And so consequently, because we're putting so much money into drug development, we don't have any time for drug discovery, which is where, of course, we find the new drugs that might possibly be able to cure people. And this is why drug prices are also so expensive. Because, um, you know, if you have exponentially increasing costs, and it's the cost of the getting FDA approval that is really the driver behind uh, soaring pharmaceutical prices. But these 1962 regulations, the Kefauver Harris Amendments, didn't just affect drug development, they affected manufacturing, advertising, and the risk of drug development. So in a sense, they, they pushed investors to ask for more profit because it got riskier to try to get a drug to the marketplace. And it also got much riskier to do a new drug. For example, the FDA actually called me up one day and uh, the examiner for the GI section, gastrointestinal section, which is, you know, the kind of people I interacted with said, Dr. Ruart, we're very excited because we hear that you have filed for a patent for prostaglandins and liver disease. Now, of course, as a voluntarist, I really, you know, I'm not a big fan of patents, but um, of course the regulations are so stringent now that unless you have a patent, there's, there's no hope of recovering your costs of development. So I had filed that. Plus patent. you have to use it defensively too, right? Because if uh, it, with the system way it's set up, if you don't file it, someone else will file it and then you just lose everything, right? Yes, yes. So anyhow, the, the FDA was very excited because as the examiner said, 100,000 people die every year from liver disease. This is fibro fibrotic liver disease and there is no cure these people just are told basically to take bed rest, you know, which is nothing. So um, they wanted to help us get the drug to market. But the problem is when you really have a new drug, you don't know how many times a day you have to give it. You don't know what dose you have to give. You don't know how long you have to treat a patient, especially a patient that has liver disease because it develops over time and it probably is going to take some time to reverse it. And then, um, you don't know how many people you need in the study to get the statistical significance that the FDA demands. And if you guess wrong on any of these parameters and the study doesn't have that statistical significance, then you have to start all over. 
And so the company management figured that by the that that the chances were pretty high we'd have to start over because we just there was so much we didn't know and our patent would be expired by the time we got to market. So they decided even with the FDA's support that we weren't going to develop prostaglandins for liver disease. And this is the problem is that the new drugs that are hardest to get through the regulatory process. So a lot of companies are more focused on me too drugs because you know they can at least get it through the process. So innovation is really squelched and the studies that have been done say at least 50% of the drugs in late or mid phase development drop off, not because they don't work, not because they aren't safe, but because the manufacturer has figured out that they aren't gonna be able to recover their costs. It's just not gonna be worth it economically to develop this drug. So if we lose 50% in late phase and mid phase development, and then we lose a bunch more before the development even gets started, such as with prostaglandins and liver disease, you know, a lot of drugs are not being developed. We may have lost as much as 80% of our innovation. Now, if you assume we only lost 50% and those lost drugs are only 25% as, as effective as the ones we have on the market today, that's still 26.7 million people. And you can actually calculate the number who have died waiting because we have an estimate of how many lives or life years that the drugs currently on the market save. That's 15 million. That all translates to about five years off of each of our lives. So this is, this is a very deadly set of regulations. And this is, I'm just comparing the before 1962 and after 1962 when, you know, really tough regulations were put into effect. I'm not even counting the regulations which were before that. So you can see these are very deadly. And I haven't even talked about the most deadly one, which is the, the one where there's a lot of truthful information about drugs and supplements and nutrition and foods that are out there that the FDA is really um, basically censoring. They tell manufacturers that if they talk about these truthful things about their products, that it becomes a drug and has to go through 14 years of <laughs> regulatory process. And, and even like the cherry growers and diamond walnuts have been threatened with prosecution if they don't take the references to scientific articles off their website that say that the components of these foods are beneficial and healthful. And since we all need to eat to live, <laughs> it, it seems kind of crazy uh, to tell food manufacturers or food producers that they, they can't talk about how their, their foods actually keep us healthy. Yeah, I think that's all on purpose. I think they want a really sick uh, population. I think this is really just sort of a top-down sort of uh, the the main the very wealthy people who control most of the pharmaceutical companies. They ha they want these regulations in place, and uh, they want to keep people generally sick their entire lives, and and they want to keep out competition. And uh, it's pretty amazing as anarchists or voluntarists that uh, you know some people when you bring up uh, anarchy or voluntarism, they'll say, yeah, well, what what would happen without the FDA? It's like, well, as According to you, we'd live a lot longer. Uh, we'd have access to uh, a lot more uh, solutions. Uh, and not to mention, just what a joke the entire thing is, when you have the water supply of most people in the U.S. has fluoride in it, rat poison. <laughs> where's, where's the FDA on that? Uh, uh, and then there's a whole other thing with, the, with this opiate sort of uh, thing that's going on. Um, of course, we saw the U.S. kind of take over Afghanistan. The troops are now uh, guarding the poppy fields. Uh, there's now an opioid epidemic in the U.S. And it's mostly from government-approved uh, drugs like OxyContin and things like that, uh, getting people addicted to these things. And it's essentially heroin, in my opinion. Do you have any opinions on sort of what's been going on in the opiate crisis? Uh, I don't have the best opinions, but uh, Dr. Kyle Varner, who's also a member of the Liberty International Board, has actually uh, done some research on this. And he feels that part of the problem is that safer uh, pain medication has been uh, limited and what's been pushed is this less safe medication and yeah. he would be a good person to interview on that actually and also he talks about uh, the regulations on medical licensing so since you're very into uh, the health and the regulation of health that might be somebody you'd want to talk to.
Yeah, if he's a voluntarist, I definitely will. If not, I don't really want to talk to him. Oh, he yes. is. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> yes. Well, most of the Liberty International board is. I think we may oh, have great. one board member who's not. And that's, that's why when I was learning about voluntarism, um, I, I learned a lot from those pamphlets because it's always been basically a, an organization that understands anarchy and, and really, um, you know, really has maintained their stand on that. So that's something that uh, your, your listeners might want to know. Yeah, I wasn't even aware of the organization. That's great. I, I don't know what's going on. There's definitely a glitch in the matrix that I wasn't aware of some of the things that you're doing. And, and uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, we're figuring this out now so we can all uh, uh, get in contact and, and have more uh, resources uh, to uh, uh, figure out what's going on and figure out how we, how we can fix a lot of these problems. Uh, so is there anything else you want to talk about with the FDA and our regulations that, uh, that you see as being problems? Well, you know, I it was interesting. I actually haven't seen with my own eyes or heard with my own ears, even though I was in the industry, uh, this business about uh, an attempt to uh, keep people sick, for example, although it could have happened at the higher echelons. You know, research scientists don't necessarily um, associate with the upper echelons. Uh, but I actually had, when I put death by regulation out, it was interesting. I got a couple people that came and said, well, these regulations were probably pushed by the pharmaceutical industry. And I said, well, according to my research, the industry fought these regulations, but you know, I'd like to see anything you have that says differently. And, and one person especially said, I'm gonna find this information. Well, they couldn't find it. So I think maybe the 62 regulations were an exception to what is normally the rule, which is what you said, you know, uh, the regulations are put in place to keep competition out. So um, I, I thought that was kind of an interesting anomaly. So I guess the problem is that people think regulations protect them. And they're so sure of that that when you start talking about getting rid of regulations, they sort of freak out. And this, this is indicative, I think, of, um, I guess, how far away we are from the principles of liberty you know, that our founders were really excited about and held dear. So I guess that's really, uh, really sad from my perspective. And this is true really in so many ways, but, but in healthcare especially, people do not understand that the government is so involved in our healthcare because it's largely invisible. Hardly anybody knows about what goes on in terms of the regulations that drug companies, for example, need to meet to get their product to market. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to share that information without a lot of data. And thankfully, the pharmaceutical industry has been studied so much that there's actually data there. You know, with the supplement and food industry, we can point to specific instances, but we can't really get a number, an estimate of how many people have died from that. But I believe, <laughs> based on my research, that we, we probably have lost more years of our lives to lack of prevention because of these regulations than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, you can just see what's going on with the people that are in control of these uh, uh, things like the FDA, for example, like ex Monsanto executive Michael Taylor was the head or I don't know if he still is, was the head of the FDA. So a lot of these uh, big uh, corporations, they move in and out of the government. For example, with banking, for example, the ex head of the FBI worked for HSBC. The ex head of Met Police works for HSBC. The ex head of MI5 works for HSBC. The ex head of fraud at City Police works for HSBC. The ex Saudi ambassador works for HSBC. Uh, this just goes on and on. So we, what we see is this, uh, it's sort of like fascism, isn't it? It's sort of uh, uh, the corporations and the government are almost becoming completely tied to each other. And, and what these corporations do is they will put their, uh, let's just look at, for example, the, uh, the Federal Reserve and uh, the uh, Treasury, the Treasury Department, they all come from Goldman Sachs. Uh, Federal Reserve, a lot of those people are sort of Goldman Sachs people, but definitely the Treasury Department. Um, so it's just this, it's this sort of fascist sort of uh, regulation. And 
what they do is they tell people, oh, this is all here to, uh, you know, regulate the market and to protect you. No, it's not. It's to protect them, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and, you know, in the case of the FDA, before these 1962 regulations, you know, this movement, the revolving doors, we call it, between the uh, FDA and the pharmaceutical company really was pretty much, I, I don't want to say it was non-existent. Some people did move over, but it was very few. I, I can't recall exactly the numbers, but right after <laughs> these amendments passed, uh, what was happening is that number shot up greatly. And that's because a pharmaceutical company knows that if they upset the FDA examiners, not because of any data they have, but because they maybe don't consult them enough or something, that they can drag their feet on the approvals. So they try to bring in people that have worked at the FDA so that that person or people can guide them through the process in a way that they won't be offending the FDA examiners and, and therefore won't have a problem uh, you know, which is totally political in nature as opposed to data. So, and, and, you know, there's a lot of politics that goes on there. So I think that we should expect that. And when there is heavy regulation, the only way the companies survive is to, you know, bring in the regulators into their company to help advise them on how to handle it. And then we have this revolving door. And then we have even more conflict of interest because what happened, at, at least because in the, again, in the case of the drug industry, because this 14 year time frame was so horrific, uh, what happened is when the AIDS epidemic hit, the AIDS community hired black market chemists to make the same drugs we were working on at Upjohn or other companies. And by the time the FDA gave us permission to test them in people, every AIDS patient in the country who wanted them already had them and they were resistant. So we had to wait uh, for people to be diagnosed with AIDS so that we could get what we call naive subjects. But the, the, the reason that's important is that people began to realize, hey, we've, got, we've added so much time due to the regulations to the development time, you know, we need to shorten it. So the solution they came up with created a huge conflict of interest with the FDA. The FDA started charging what they called user fees. Uh, and the drug companies could pay these. They started out at 100,000 and the FDA would hire new examiners. And then the process of reviewing all the data that the companies put together, which took about two years at this point in time, in the early 90s, uh, was reduced to one year, which was great, except over time, the cost of the user fee has grown to over $2.4 million per new drug. So now 50 to 70% of the salaries of the FDA examiners are paid for by the pharmaceutical industry. And so if you think about it, the FDA has this huge conflict of interest. The industry they're supposed to be regulating is who are paying their salaries. And in the case of Vioxx, which is probably the most toxic drug ever put on the U.S. market, uh, one of the FDA examiners said, hey, this thing could be causing heart attacks. I don't think we should approve it. And his supervisor said, well, our client is the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> and so they approved it. And by the FDA's own admission, uh, something like 160,000 heart attacks were caused by Vioxx in the, I think it was four or five years it was on the market, and, and 60,000 people died. And, and that's probably a low estimate. So you can, you can see if, if, you know, if a scientist had 70% of their salary paid for by a company and they did a study they would have to report that conflict of interest in their publications and you know people would think wow you know this this person's bought and paid for by the company we can't trust this data but somehow with the fda we don't even think about it 
Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, the case with pretty much everything in government. Um, one thing that uh, I noticed uh, that a lot of people are starting to wake up to this, uh, a lot of people are starting to realize the problem with this government and regulations is that it essentially gets co-opted by uh, the big uh, companies. And this happens in the military industrial complex, the prison industrial complex, uh, the pharmaceutical industrial complex. Um, and so uh, a lot of people are saying that the reason Donald Trump got elected was because he was going to drain the swamp. Uh, we haven't really seen him drain the swamp whatsoever but I did notice there was one thing that apparently he did pass or, or uh, yeah he, he signed it into law apparently and this is back in uh, May 30th 2018 Trump signs right to try allowing gravely ill patients to bypass FDA for experimental medicines uh, is that true and in, in your opinion is Trump actually possibly helping in some ways here well you know it's interesting right to try was put out by the Goldwater Institute and it was actually basically asking for the same change in regulation that the cancer patients did when they sued the FDA and lost. The cancer patients said the Constitution guarantees us, you know, a right to life and, and we should be able to take on approved drugs, you know, if we're terminally ill because, you know, what choice do we have, right? And the courts ruled that uh, Americans do not have the constitutional right to save their lives with unapproved drugs. So the backlash from that was right to try. And basically what Goldwater was asking, and they did this state by state, by the way, initially, they were asking for uh, terminally ill patients to be able to take unapproved drugs and go directly to the company and negotiate for it. Like maybe they'd pay them even. And um, this could happen after what we call phase one, the first part of human testing, which is safety testing. So right after that, uh, somebody could try a new cancer drug, for example. Well, the problem, though, is this. We talked about how the FDA can drag their feet on approvals and punish companies if they do things they don't like. And I think most companies are fearful that if they actually engage in right to try, that the FDA will punish them. And, and I explained this to Goldwater and they have, you know, they have, they understand that and, and they have been experiencing that to some extent with Right to Try, which went national, as, as you mentioned, and Trump did sign it into law. In fact, he asked for Congress to pass it, which is a kudo for him. But the nice thing about the whole Right to Try debate is it's, it's alerted people to the fact that there's this big waiting period for drugs. It takes so long to get from the lab bench to the marketplace. Now coming along from the Heartland Institute is free to choose medicine. This is similar to Right to Try with one big exception. They took it very seriously when I explained what the Achilles heel was and they changed their free to choose uh, proposal to actually create a second track. So if a drug enters the free to choose medicine track, it can stay there forever. It doesn't need to stay in FDA's good graces as it does in the right to try track. So my hope is that the next thing we'll see passed is free to choose medicine. Have basically two separate tracks for drug development. Um, they do have to, drugs do have to go through the phase one human safety testing, just like they do for right to try, and one what we call phase two testing, which is a bigger study that does more safety and a little bit of effectiveness. So if that passes, we will essentially, I think, end up with a two-tiered track. And that will, <laughs> and, 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 you know, the market will decide, and uh, companies and uh, patients will, you know, decide to have a drug put in the free to choose medicine track or not, and then we can compare notes, you know, and see see how things are going. Obviously, I'd like to get rid of the FDA entirely if I could, and and yeah. the type of drug regulations we're doing now. But um, I think sometimes uh, sometimes we need to take a step at a time, and I think free to choose medicine would be a good second step. So I'm I'm hoping for that. Yeah, very interesting. And of course, I hope the FDA goes away and the U.S. government goes away and all of it goes away. Uh, that might be a good question just to ask you to kind of finish off here. And of course, if you have anything else to add, just feel free to add. But uh, for, the, for the average person who's watching, they might not know a lot about all this stuff and they might think, oh, we need the FDA to help us and, and that sort of thing. What, what do you think would happen if the FDA was just shut down tomorrow? 
Well, I think what we would have instead of regulation is we'd have what we had before 1962, which is that we had some third party testing, which is really good because the FDA doesn't test any drugs. What they do is they tell the manufacturers what tests they need to do. The manufacturers put the package together. The package, at least when I was there, was a truckload of information, literally a truck. And uh, it would be driven to Washington to you know, put all that paper out for the FDA. So um, if the FDA were shut down, the third party testing, uh, such as the American Medical Association used to do, uh, would, would probably come back. We'd have something like um, underwriters laboratories for drugs. And yeah. so, so basically what would happen is that companies would pay to have their products certified because you know, consumers aren't going to want to just take anything. They want to take something that they have an idea is actually safe and effective. Well, of course, no drugs are totally safe and effective, so that's not really a good criteria, but, you know, can be well tolerated <laughs> and effective in some people. That's about the best you can do. So um, third party testing, I think, would come back. And just like we had Underwriters Laboratory for electrical appliances, we would have, um, we would have, which is a private institution, uh, we would have certifiers for drugs. And some people don't think this is possible, but you know, there's already consumer organizations who are essentially doing that. What they're doing, um, for example, the Abigail Alliance focuses on cancer drugs. And what they've done is they, they look at the data from these studies and they have actually recommended to the FDA that it go ahead and approve 40 different drugs years before the FDA actually did it because they said, okay, these are gonna be good drugs. And sure enough, they all got approved. They're all on the market. And my feeling is if a consumer organization can do that good of a job, <laughs> certainly a professional organization should be able to be a good third-party certifier. Yeah, absolutely. And as you pointed out, uh, in its current form, the FDA is actually reducing people's lives by an average of five to 10 years. So, so pretty good idea just to get rid of it. But as you know, and as you said, uh, you know, these things take time and things don't happen overnight. And we have to just try to do our best within what we have to uh, improve things. And that's what you're trying to do with your book. So I wish you the best of luck with your book. I'm sure you'll give me the link to put down below so people can check it out. Uh, is there anything else you want to let people know about yourself or anything you want to finish up on? Or do you have websites, yes. blogs? Yes. Yes, well, yes. Um, if they go to my website, if your listeners go to my website, which is ruart.com, R-U-W-A-R-T.com, just like my last name, and go to my free library, you can actually read the 1993 edition of Healing Our World online uh, or download it. And it's really good because it talks about all the voluntary solutions without actually using the word rights or anarchism or anything else. So it really kind of puts it out there in a, I'm, what I hoped was a much more um, understandable presentation. Because I think one of the things that happens is we know our own lingo and we talk about it among ourselves, but some of it has been so distorted uh, by, by people misusing it. For example, the right to healthcare, you know, that's, that's not what we mean when we say rights. So I, I tried to use just common everyday language and also point out uh, studies that have been done that show how liberty works in the real world. And I think the latest edition of Healing has over a thousand references on how that happens. Because most people aren't aware that the things that we recommend in terms of you know freedom and liberty and voluntarism have mostly all been tried at some point in time in some country and been very successful so that's always very heartening to see and of course i have a couple chapters from short answers uh, there on my website and of course you can learn how to buy death by regulation healing our world short answers and I have uh, audio and digital copies of everything except Death by Regulation isn't in audio yet. <laughs> it's coming.
That's great. Uh, I wasn't aware of Healing Your wor Our World. Um, this sounds uh, very good. It sounds like a much needed book. Uh, the, it reminds me of the book, The Market for Liberty, uh, which uh, kind of uh, lays out uh, a little bit of how the world would work without uh, government and, and, and that sort of thing. So I'm definitely going to check it out. I'm going to add it to my reading list. Thank you for letting me know about that. And I'll have all the links to all that down below. Uh, I'd like to thank Mary for coming on. She, I, I invited her before uh, we spoke, after I found out who she was. I invited her to speak in Arcapulco. She said she has some things planned in February, but if she can figure it out she might come down so you have an open invitation to speak at a Narcopogo uh, coming up February 14th to 17th if not maybe the year after it's been a pleasure Mary thank you for coming on and that's it for Anarchast your home for anarchy on the internet peace love and anarchy <laughs>